How do you talk about the weather? You will watch the sky and talk about today's weather. Why we measure the weather? We measure the weather because it is important for us to know what the weather will be. If we know it is going to be cold outside, we can wear our mittens, coats, and hats. If it's going to rain on our way home from school, we know to use our umbrellas. A meteorologist can help us know what kind of weather we should expect. A meteorologist or weather person is a scientist who tells us the weather. They use tools to collect weather data so they can discover the patterns which will help them predict what the weather is going to be. The weather, it's there every day. Sun, wind, and rain are basic to life. How can we know when the weather is going to change? If tomorrow will bring storms? We can measure the weather accurately from satellites to radar. Modern inventions describe the weather today. And this helps us predict what it may be like tomorrow. There's a science to predicting weather and it's called meteorology. One tool that meteorologists often use are thermometers. A thermometer measures the temperature of something. When a meteorologist uses a thermometer, they're measuring how hot or cold it is outside. Temperature can be measured in Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is a measurement of temperature using a scale on which water boils at 212 degrees and freezes at 32 degrees. Temperature can also be measured in Celsius. Celsius is a measurement of temperature using a scale on which water boils at 100 degrees and freezes at zero degrees. Most scientists use Celsius when they measure temperature. Meteorologists also measure how much rain an area has received. A rain gauge measures the rainfall. A rain gauge is a clear tube that has marks on it for inches or centimeters. As the rain falls, it fills the tube. Once the rain has stopped, meteorologists can read the scale to see how much rain fell. Meteorologists also measure how much snow has fallen. You can measure how much snow has fallen too by using a ruler or meter stick. Once the snow has stopped falling, you can push the ruler into the snow until it touches the ground. Read the measurement where the snow stops. This tells you how deep the snow is. Meteorologists measure the direction of the wind using a wind vane. A wind vane is a tool that shows which way the wind is blowing. Wind vanes can be on the ground or on the roof of a building. Meteorologists use special tools to measure the speed of the wind as well. We can measure the speed of the wind by looking at things around us. We can watch the leaves, trees, or even a flag to figure out how fast the wind is blowing. If the flag, leaves, or trees are barely moving, we know that there is very little wind. However, if the flag is moving a little bit, we know the wind is slightly stronger. When you look outside and see the flag flying and the trees are moving, you know the wind is a little bit stronger. meteorologists, we can learn a lot about the weather by looking at the clouds in the sky. Clouds are made of tiny drops of water that float in the air. The shape and color of the clouds can help us predict the weather. Some clouds mean a sunny day, like these on the left. Other clouds mean it is going to rain or storm, such as these on the right. Think about it. What else can we learn about the weather by looking outside? Let's find out. There are many different types of weather. Snowy, sunny, cool and breezy, rainy, foggy, windy, 
warm and drizzly, just to name a few. How would you describe the weather today where you live? Windy? Chilly? Hot? Wet? All of these terms describe the weather. Now think about which season it is. The weather is a good way to figure out which season it is. The summer season is usually the warmest. In some places, it can be very hot. The weather changes every day. The temperature becomes warmer or colder. The amount of moisture in the air changes and the wind changes speed. People who study the weather must measure these things so that they can forecast or predict what the weather will be. Will you need a raincoat? Is it going to be hot? Sometimes the temperature, wind, and moisture combine to create extreme weather. When tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods occur, they can cause a lot of damage. People usually try to get out of the way during extreme weather events like these. Lucky for us, extreme weather doesn't happen everywhere all the time. Scientists can usually forecast when it will occur. This helps people prepare for extreme weather. There are many types of weather and there are four seasons. The weather changes with the season. It is usually warmer in the summer and cooler in the winter. Depending on where you live, the change of season may bring small changes to the weather or big changes. Each year, the cycle of seasons starts all over again. Take a peek outside your window. What can you tell about the weather today? Is it hot or is it cold? Is it sunny or maybe it's raining? Is it windy? How do you know? Charlie Lyles, whose day job is chief of a NOAA weather station, also has a hobby, weather reporting, the old-fashioned way. This is one of about 12,000 weather stations we have across the United States that uh, are cooperative stations. And at least once a day, we measure temperatures here, the high temperature, the low temperature, and precipitation uh, in two different rain gauges. I measure the temperature off of here. Every day, Charlie phones his weather report into a national computer system where it is added to the 12,000 other daily observations. We're right in the middle of thunderstorm season, but you can see no rain today. And all of these stations across the country have uh, helped define the climate of this country. We've had some stations for as long as uh, 100 years or more. Observing the weather, up close and personal, every day, both as work and as a pastime, we would just measure snow depth right here, has given Charlie the experience to provide hints on how to make your own forecast. His version of red skies at night, sailor's delight. I think that further east in the country, and especially in the wintertime, you can recognize signs of oncoming storms. And when you do see uh, things like a halo around the moon at night, or you see the cirrus clouds off to the west that seem to be thickening, then sometimes it is a sign of an approaching storm. In the western United States, mountain ranges make forecasting more iffy. But some cloud types are important indicators. One thing that we really look for, and, and I think a lot of outdoors people look carefully for our lenticular clouds, these wave-shaped, concave-shaped clouds over the mountains that tell you that the winds are very strong at mountaintop level. Why should we expect to have a weather forecast at all? Part and parcel of every man's spirit of hope is his immemorial desire to know what the future holds in store. That would seem to be the realm of fortune tellers, tarot readers, tea leaf inspectors. 
We can never see over the rainbow. We can never see beyond the moment. This is a storm I'm going to be watching very carefully as it moves through the plains tomorrow and by late Friday and Saturday, maybe now, maybe uh, once again becoming a coastal Despite storm. Despite all of our right advanced now, technology, like a weather forecast is and will always be what south, might be. In the meantime, now, the, one, the good news. The what might be's have been coming true more and more often. Our 24-hour forecast, that is for the next day forecast, is now close to 90% accurate. Nine out of ten times, the forecast for all intents and purposes will be accurate. Television meteorologist Bob Ryan can achieve such accuracy because he can access two major innovations. Satellites crammed with sophisticated sensors to probe the Earth's atmosphere down below. Supercomputers to make sense of the numbers, to match the patterns in the atmosphere with the complex formulas in their cyber memory. For thousands of years, our ancestors searched for patterns that would foretell future weather. One early belief held that the first 12 days of the new year foretold the weather for the next 12 months. If the first day was sunny, January would be sunny. If it snowed the second day, February would be stormy, and so on. Of course, throwing dice would have given them about the same odds. The fellow who made one of the first correct connections was America's favorite son of science, Ben Franklin. Franklin, living in Philadelphia in 1743, had written to his brother 300 miles away in Boston, suggesting they both observe a scheduled eclipse of the moon. Franklin missed the eclipse, but he did make an important discovery about meteorology. It was overcast, and in fact, a storm was passing, and his brother saw the eclipse, Franklin did not, and then a, a, a day later, the brother experienced the storm, and so Benjamin Franklin is often credited with the uh, first realization that storms have these trajectories. Franklin's discovery that weather travels from west to east was a milestone in understanding weather. The problem? Communication. Clouds move faster than horses. A revolution in communications was needed, and it was a century before it would be invented. The first primitive telegraph was demonstrated to the public in May 1844. Telegraph lines soon linked to the eastern settled sections of America. That development led to the first storm reporting network. The telegraph operators had an agreement with the Smithsonian that in the morning, that when they were clearing their lines and establishing their circuits, they would chatter about the weather. The reports were forwarded to the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Joseph Henry. And he had special disks prepared. He had disks that were indicated clear sky and dark disks that indicated cloudiness and uh, rain. And he would hang these disks on pegs on this map of the United States. And there, in one glance, you could see the basic meteorological conditions of the country. The nation's first weather map. But development of an official national reporting system was delayed by the Civil War. In 1866, Henry began to rebuild the volunteer network. And uh, by 1870, there's talk in Congress of a bill to fund a national storm warning system. It was called uh, Reports and Telegrams for the Benefit of Commerce. So the commercial link to weather information was there from the very beginning. That government agency is now known as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. NOAA operates the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, NSEP for short, where people attempt to see into the future, to create the what might be's. So how do you think this is going to evolve? It looks like it's uh, pretty much of an ocean storm here. The aviation or the MRF model has the best handle on the system with the UK Met similar. Their principal tools are computer models, color pictures of what might happen. A computer can create a picture of anything that does not yet exist, a new car, a new building, at the prediction center, the computer creates a model of a weather map, weather that doesn't exist as yet. That's what really, I think, amazes the people the most. It's like, hey, you're predicting a storm two or three days in advance. Where is it? 
and we tell them it's not there yet, but here's the system, here's the, the signal in the atmosphere that's going to lead to that development. A computer-generated map is an estimate about the future weather. The estimating will only be as good as the information it has about the present weather. To that end, the NCEP supercomputers take in a vast array of data from all over the globe, minute by minute. In Rapid City, South Dakota, a weather balloon hoists a tiny radio transmitter 20 miles into the atmosphere. A thousand balloons like this are launched every day. They radio back temperature, humidity, and pressure as radar and satellite tracking provide wind speed and direction. An airline pilot describes the conditions along international routes. An automatic ocean buoy sends in more data. Meanwhile, the big brothers out in space, the weather satellites, send back measurements of the planet's radiance to indicate cloud cover, temperatures, and water vapor. Important data streaming back hour by hour from remote locations that, before the space age, were rarely heard from year to year. When the forecasters think they have all they can cram into their supercomputers, they punch go. At 15 billion calculations a second, it will still take three hours to crank out model pictures of the vast weather system over the country and create projections of what might be up to 14 days in advance. The accuracy of these forecasts varies. As the farther north we go, the greater the threat of snow. Um, Steve has gone back more toward an MRF solution. The forecasters the often uh, modify the computer projections based on their long experience with models and the weather. Then the results are routed out over the wires and the internet to people like meteorologist Bob Ryan. My job is to take uh, the best information uh, available to that and, and say, now here's what uh, is happening now. Here's what you should be anticipating. Around our Four Winds neighborhood storm station. Ryan's weather reports are seen uh, down on the Maryland shore where the sun could be shining. He also has viewers up in West Virginia where they might be getting heavy snows. That is a problem when trying to predict weather using current global models that only see the big picture. They cannot be relied on to predict what might happen inside areas less than a hundred miles across. Most people have to plan their days based on the forecast for their own neighborhood. People don't appreciate going to work in spring clothes and coming home in a blizzard. At the moment, the prediction center is having a problem peering into the future. A fast-moving winter storm system dumping snow from Seattle to Salt Lake is being driven by a La Nina pattern in the Pacific Ocean. It is a major shift in the winter flow. As a result, the five computer models are indicating five different forecasts. When we have very fast flow coming out of the Gulf of Alaska into the Pacific Northwest, models generally show lower skill, so we get a lot of changes, a lot of surprises. Caribou, Maine is 41, 41.35 in Caribou. Bob Ryan looked at the NOAA forecast, reviewed the models, and decided that the storm would pass south of the nation's capital. But the dawn's early light in Washington, D.C. revealed that while the forecasters had the timing right, they had missed the target. We were predicting a one to three inch snow event for Washington, D.C. that would basically start afternoon. And I looked out my window at seven o'clock in the morning and it's starting to snow. So you already know you have a problem. Our weather watcher is reporting upwards of a foot of snow. Lowell Coons and Annandale, 11 inches. Vienna had 11 inches. Leesburg, 9 inches. Missing. They call for uh, like a little snow and you get all this. Here lately, I don't think they've gotten any of them right. Well, you could call it a bust. <laughs> they bust the <laughs> forecast. It doesn't quite work out as you had anticipated. Uh, nature, you know, still has a number of tricks up her sleeve that uh, we can't figure everything out. What the forecasters could not have predicted with their present technology 
was the vertical winds in the storm front, which enhanced the snowfall just as the system stalled right over Washington, D.C. And those types of forecast problems pose a tremendous challenge to us, not only from a modeling point of view, but from a forecaster point of view. I often mention it's a combination of psychology and meteorology. People will always remember the, the one-day forecast that was wrong and forget the, uh, the 99 day for the, the 90 day days that it was right. But that's, you know, that's human nature. Here we are in Washington. Viewers trust Ryan. His forecasts are right more than 90% of the time. It has been breaking up a bit, but still. Besides, their only real alternative would be to find some basic gear and try to predict the weather themselves. Let's review what we have learned today. You learned how meteorologists collect information about the weather. You saw examples of the tools they use to collect the information when they watch the sky. Why don't you look outside and see what you can learn about the weather by watching the sky? Can you tell if it's windy outside? What do the clouds tell you? Do you think it's going to rain? Be sure to tell someone in your family or a friend what you learned about the weather when you looked outside. Have fun looking at the sky and keep studying the weather this week.